Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in person after, after what's been a long, long time. Um, yeah, so this was a talk I actually put together for um, SRE Con Americas in 2020, and uh, at least some of us know how, how that went or didn't go. Um, so we'll start with the obligatory audience participation, just to check everyone's awake after lunch. Um, how many people could draw a diagram of the thing they are on call for, or the thing that they like administer in their day jobs, and then explain it to someone else in the room with no, with no background? How many people are confident they could do that? Good number. All right, I like that. Um, for those of you who work in a team where there's like shared responsibility for that, for that stack, um, how many of you think that if you pick two random members of that team, they would draw the same or approximately, like recognizably the same diagram? Many, many fewer hands. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's kind of, kind of what I expected. Um, yeah, so who am I? Um, we'll get into the, those, the why of those questions in a second. Uh, I'm currently an SRE at Snowflake. Uh, I'm obliged by my company lawyers to say I'm not speaking on behalf of Snowflake in this particular um, uh, conference. I've worked in infrastructure at a couple of other companies, uh, and you can find me at mSuria on, on Twitter and GitHub. Um, so, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, my DMs are open. Um, why are we talking about this? Um, why do I think crayon, engineering, crayon drawing is important? Uh, we manage complex systems is the reason. Uh, we manage complex systems, and <sighs> complex systems are difficult, right? Running them is hard. Uh, how do you reason about them? Um, how do systems respond in steady state, and how do they respond in various degraded modes, uh, given a set of faults, like what, what could be going on here? Like how do you think about uh, what your system is doing versus what you expect it to be doing? Um, and also documentation. So to the, to the point I just asked questions about, like how do you explain what your system does to someone who's not familiar with it, right? Maybe it's a, an internal customer. Maybe it's some of your developers who are like, how do I use this Kubernetes thing? Or maybe it's your execs saying, why did this particular VM falling over mean that none of my customers could, um, could you know, actually pay me for anything? Um, and then documentation itself is, is difficult, right? Like how there's a trade-off between accuracy and freshness and complexity and how easy is it to comprehend at a distance um, and you know visually how noisy is it how are you able to quickly extract features um, so how do we make all of this tractable um, in my experience um, software engineering technology as a whole is is largely about making abstractions right um, all abstractions are wrong some are useful but fundamentally we build abstractions and Speaking for myself, I find visual abstractions useful. I know it's not for everyone, um, but I'm hopefully going to convince at least some of you that, that they have their place. Um, so I'm going to do a super, super bold move, and I'm going to try and <laughs> live draw my home network uh, in, a, in a presentation. Um, so let's see how this goes. Um, all right, so I literally haven't planned this. I'm going to do it off the, on the hoof. So what does the internet look like? So you have a big eye internet over here. I have a WAN connection coming into my home. I have like my router. I have another cloud here, which is my LAN. And then off here, I have my phone. I have my NAS. I have my Chromecast or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is one way to draw my home network. And it's not a terrible diagram to start with, right? Um, another way to draw my home network is actually, well, there's a bit more subtlety here um, because I'm a networking nerd. In addition to just one LAN off my router, I have my router, I have a wireless AP, and off my wireless AP, I have one subnet, which is all my mobile devices, and then off my router, I also have a switch, which has a bunch of other devices. Uh, you know, my NAS, my IoT, whatever thingies, my, my desktop, et cetera, et cetera. Yet a, th yet a third diagram is I could do like an abstract diagram where we have, say, I have my Wi-Fi. And I'm not putting devices here. I'm just putting what network engineers would call subnets. I have my wired LAN. And then I have my jail, which is for all of the untrusted internet of 
the S for internet, the S for in IoT stands for security, right? And so all of these diagrams are different. Um, but the, the big question that I want everyone to think about is, physical layers, blah, 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 that was just some prompts, which of those is the most accurate and which of them is the most useful? And hopefully, the answer to all trick questions is, it depends. Um, and so the question then becomes, another way to answer this question is, what would you use of those to debug, say, stuttering video playback from your NAS to your phone or to your laptop or to your desktop? Um, what would you use to debug, um, you know, usenix.org uh, not loading particularly quickly on, on a device, right? Depending on the problem you're trying to solve, you need to think about a different level of abstraction. Um, the key point here is I did these off the top of my head, and I'm pretty sure if you came and asked me to draw them and get, like, I didn't put any particular thought into them. But if you came and asked me to draw my home network again tomorrow or the day after or next week, 90% certain I would draw a variant of one of these three things, right? It's just, um, and part of that is I'm a network engineer by background originally, and so I, ha I have kind of a standard way of drawing things. But it's also because I think about this a lot, right? Like, depending on the type of nerd you are, if you're the sort of person who spends a lot of time with your, with your home network, you probably have a mental model in your head. You may or may not be able to draw it consistently, because as with all skills, this is a thing that takes practice. But given a bit of thought, you probably can. Um, so what are, we, what, are we, what are we using this for? Why, does, why is this relevant beyond just my home network? So what kind of problems are we trying to solve here? Um, what we're going to do is this is now actual demo time. I'm going to, I claim, um, take two systems that I have been on call for, the documentation of which is now publicly available, and so hopefully no lawyers will come for me. And I'm going to draw them, and I'm going to explain them to all of you in about, am I a 20 minute or 30 minute slot? 20. Uh, in about like two minutes each, and we'll see how useful that is, and maybe I'll tell you a few stories about what we did with those. So, if I draw a new diagram, what shall we do first? Let's do, let's do Traffic 101, because why not? So, uh, once upon a time, I was on a team at Google called Traffic Team. Um, that's the team responsible for approximately getting user traffic from the outside internet to things that can actually respond to your queries, right? And so that encompasses, you know, DNS, it encompasses network load balancers, it encompasses reverse proxies and a bunch, you know, caching and a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to draw a diagram, and I'm going to tell you something about that diagram, he says. So we have a user. Uh, they make a DNS request to... NS1, I have to be careful not to use internal code names. Um, and then they connect over the big eye internet. And then they come in and they hit again. Actually, no, I can talk about that one. They hit maglev. And they hit GFE. And they hit and GFE talks to GSLB. And then GFE then talks to what are called AFEs, and I'll explain these terms in a second. And then there's more stuff off the back here, right? Not a huge number of com components here, but whatever. And in fact, let's, let's, let's say NS1 lives over here because it's inside Google, right? And this is like 8888 or something, which also lives inside Google, but it's just a different thing. I did that off the top of my head. Um, I have not been on call for this since 2017. Um, I guarantee, and you know, there may be some minor details that have changed here, and it's entirely possible there are people who work on this today who are here today. But I guarantee you, if you went to anyone in the traffic team who had worked in that team in Google for the last 10 years, they would draw this or something 90% close to it um, in terms of, you know, draw me the, the thing you give to your like first day new joiners. Um, and I can give you a one sentence description of what each of these boxes does. So 8888, recursive resolver. NS1, Authoritative name server does load balancing, like takes a DNS query, returns the IP address of a, of a front end location that is close ish to the user. Maglev, software network load balancer. There's a paper about it if people want to go and read about the magic it does, but whatever, right? Um, takes, takes, an, uh, takes a packet based on 5Tuple, sends it to, sorry, five, source and destination IP address and port, sends it to a particular back end to, to serve traffic for that thing. GFE, uh, Google's version of Nginx or Envoy, right? Uh, GSLB, approximately Istio. Um, you know, given a service, um, 
like web search or maps or whatever, find where web search and maps have capacity, and then send this request to the closest location that is, that is good for the user. And then AFE is like a generic internal term for like the, the front, the, it's called application front end, the front end for maps or the front end for web search or whatever. Um, I did that off the top of my head. I've done no revision other than, you know, I briefly looked at a reference diagram because I had to make sure it was in the public domain, but I hadn't gone and restudied it. Off the top of my head, done. And so that's one. Uh, we will do another one quickly, he says. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, another thing I was on call for was a thing called Orion, which is a, God, software-defined networking. I don't have time to explain this. Um, it's a thing that decides how to program switches. So if you imagine you have a piece of silicon that has a bunch of Ethernet ports on it uh, that you plug machines into, and you need to decide what to program into those little chips, right? And it used to be you would run like a piece of software and a crappy little embedded arm or something on the same switch device, but this got like the development environment's too constrained, and so the industry, some people in the industry have said, you know what, we want to run real software, and then we'll just have a very simple RPC protocol between these two things. So how does this work? You have a thing called the OFE, you have flow manager, you have topology manager, you have a nib, and then you have a bunch of apps off the back here, all of which perform some business logic. Um, what is OFE? It's the OpenFlow front end. OpenFlow is just a protocol for, hey, switch, program this flow into this switch. So when you see a packet matching these bits, send out this port or whatever. Um, flow manager and topology manager. Um, the topology manager talks to the um, OFE and through that to the hardware and says which ports are up, which ports are down, what switches are you connected to. And then it stores this in the thing called the nib, which is the network information base. It's just a table, you know, it's, it's a bunch of tables with access control and making sure you have ordered rights and, and so on, maintaining consistency. Flow manager looks at some other tables and says, okay, I need to make sure my default route goes out this port. Uh, what does that translate to in terms of programming? I'll, turn, I'll, I'll send that to your OFE and away it goes. And all these apps up here are responsible for specific protocols, right? There's one for like ping or trace route, and there's another one for, you know, capacity management or whatever else. Um, doesn't really matter. Again, drew that off the top of my head. Doesn't really matter. Um, the thing that is interesting about both of these diagrams, if you went to anyone in those teams, I guarantee you today, this one in particular, this diamond with like all of the apps up here and the, the switches down at the bottom, because you have multiple switches that an OFE manages, everyone but everyone will draw exactly the same diagram. The devs, the SREs, even some of the you know, partner teams who we work with who need to know about the guts of this thing. Um, so more audience participation, five minutes. Um, how many people think they could maybe draw, redraw one of the diagrams I just showed you like to like 70% accuracy-ish? And do you think you could remember the one sentence descriptions to a first approximation that I just gave you? Maybe, maybe, okay, some of you. But again, bear in mind, that was me making stuff up on the hoof with a crappy laptop presentation in about two minutes. Uh, imagine what you could do if you and your team spent some time doing this and really invested in it as a, as a learning and uh, teaching tool. So why? Why are they useful? Um, standard diagrams are useful because they are, they aid communication, they aid in training and onboarding, identifying opportunities to improve things. But the most important thing is that they build shared understanding. The most important thing about these things is actually not their accuracy. Like, it is useful for them to be a, a they should be a useful abstraction, but it is preferable for them to be easily memorable and approximately correct than for you to cover edu every edge case. Because what you're actually trying to do is trick all of your coworkers into thinking the same way about the system. Because if everyone's thinking about the same way about the system, then when you're communicating, you all have the same shared assumptions. And even if those assumptions are wrong, I would argue that actually there's value in everyone thinking the same way. And you all discover, hey, that assumption's wrong, and then you all go and, go and reassess, right? Um, so what can you use this for? Onboarding, right? A very common pattern in teams that use this, this method is within the first week, you have like the previous person who just joined the team uh, sit down with your new joiner and say, okay, here's how things work. And you know, maybe there's a slightly more experienced person in there to make sure that there aren't some details that are lighted over, but it's just a fairly standard cultural thing for like, we just keep doing this, right? Particularly traffic team, every week or two, 
someone would just grab a whiteboard and a bunch of people would sit in a room and, and okay, let's draw this. Let's go and look in this part of the diagram and explode it a bit and discuss a bit of the subtleties. Um, and, you know, reinforce shared understandings or inconsistency between team members. Um, reasoning about the system, right? If you have a diagram that lends itself to being drawn this way, where you have clear responsibility and clear separation of components and you understand their interactions at a high level, then you're like, what should be happening is this thing should be sending this message to this thing. Is that happening? Yes, no. It's not happening. Why not? Or it is sending that thing. Why is thing B not doing the thing we expect? Um, and it's also a good way of reasoning about system design, right? If you, if you plan to take, I don't know, let's say you want to move to a central authorization model. Um, so suddenly, whereas before every binary in one of those diagrams was doing its own authorization checks, uh, and you instead have a central authorization service, well, you've got a new node over here, and you know, but that node has 10 incoming edges, and it's now a single point of failure. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. So these diagrams are another way of um, a shorthand for identifying system complexity and, and upsides and downsides to system design. So how do you take this and how do you do something useful with it? Um, take system we're responsible for, try and draw it from memory. Um, do it again in a couple of days. Maybe do it today, maybe do it Thursday when the conference ends. Uh, what changes and what stays the same? Um, do your diagrams help, ex help you explain things to colleagues? Do you, expl do you learn things from your colleagues' diagrams? Um, a fun thing you might do as a team is everyone sit down in a room, everyone draw the thing you're responsible for, and then you all show it to each other together, right? I guarantee you, you probably won't all come up with the same thing, but it's a good starting conversation point. Um, use the tools which work for you, um, pen and paper, dry erase boards and markers, digital tablets, whatever. Um, there are text-based tools that generate graphs for you, so SVG and DOT uh, are good. Mermaid.js is supported natively in GitHub. Uh, this is just, in case you thought I made these up, these are the open source references that I use to confirm that the things I was talking about are legit. If you look at them, they're not quite laid out the same way, but all the same components are there, right? Like, it's the same thing, and genuinely, I just, I didn't look at them, I just, this is the thing I care about, copy, paste, and away we go. And I did them from memory, having not looked at these things in five years. It's a super, super useful uh, learning tool. So yeah, just about finished on time. Um, Ralph, are there questions in Slack?